It's episode 34 of Sport SA Daily Diary, and today we're chatting to South African mountain biker, Amy Beth McDougall. How's it, Amy? How are you doing? Hi, very well, thanks, and you? <laughs> yeah, good, thanks. Amongst a few technical challenges we've had, but uh, we're all good to go now. Yes, perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, which I'm sure you need uh, in your career more than, more than most. Yeah. Um, Amy, how's lockdown been treating you? Lockdown's actually been great. It's been really busy. Um, I've probably been busier in lockdown than I have in life before lockdown, which has been cool. <laughs> What's been keeping you busy? We adopted two dogs. So these oh. two little rescue dogs who are adolescent age. Um, so I know now why people have been telling us that we're brave to take on two adolescent rescue dogs. Yeah. <laughs> they're a lot of energy um so yeah there's no cushions on the couches we have no ornaments our house is just we like we look like we've been robbed because we can't have anything lying around there's just cow hooves everywhere we probably have about a herd of cow hooves lying around our house <laughs> oh, lovely yeah uh, I hope, I mean, hope you not stand over the stand on those in the middle of the night and injure yourself yes i have had one so i think it's probably worse than lego um <laughs> Yeah, so between that and housework, the housework is just absolutely endless and training the dogs has been so much fun. I'm doing a whole lot of actually cycling training and gym, so okay. not a dull moment, which I can't complain about. And have you been out at all? Have you been to the shops or is uh, your boyfriend doing that for you? No, no, I'm doing the shop thing. And the vets, the, the, <laughs> the one had uh, had an operation that needed to be done and... Um, I was ill for the first week of lockdown, so I was in and out of the pharmacy and hospital, and yeah, so it hasn't been, it hasn't been boring. Oh, well, at least you've been keeping busy. Yeah. Amy, you've had a, a very interesting career. Um, you started to ride at school, I believe, um, but then you got too cool for a bicycle and for the Lycra. Tell us a bit about that uh, early experiences on a bike for you. I actually didn't ride at all in school. Um, probably early primary school when I rode down the road uh, just to commute to school um, and then I only started actually riding after school so yeah it's actually quite a funny story um, it was a 94.7 in 2009 and I was 19 just out of school and like you say I was uh, too cool for school, too cool for, for Lycra. Um, my parents did riding, they did the Argus and the 94.7. So, um, yeah, I thought there's no way I'll be caught dead. But then it was six weeks before the 94.7. And my dad kind of said, who wants to enter the 94.7, you know, as like a general offer to the family as the last day to enter. And I had been wanting to start getting active again because my lifestyle was studying and partying and I was starting to get quite, I was extremely unfit and I, I thought, no, I want to start getting fit. So I ummed an odd and I said, okay, yeah, let me give this a try. And my mom said, there's no way you can do this. She, she meant it in a very motherly way of like, <laughs> you are completely unfit and healthy and now you want to do this epic challenge of the 94.7? Um, no, like you're going to hurt yourself. So all I heard was you can't do it. And I said, enter me right now. And um, I went for my first ride the next day, eight kilometers and I burst into tears. I could barely get up the hill. And I was like, it's so hard. <laughs> How am I ever going to do this epic 94.7? Um, but anyway, I carried on. I got on the bike the next day, and a few days later, I did 20 k's, and a few weeks later, I did 50, and I just went completely like obsessed. And yeah, but like complete fun rider. Um, I did my first 94.7 uh, in about five hours with my tackies and my mom's mountain bike and my polystyrene yeah. helmet at the, the back of my head. <laughs> so yeah, that was. I did start really like relatively late after school and I really started from the bottom so the journey has been a long one but a really fun and an interesting one well you say it's been a long one um and you your rise was pretty uh, meteoric but we'll come back to that um did you play any other sports at school growing up I was a hockey player 
Um, I was always a very natural athlete, so I could get away without really training and sort of enter a race and come third, you know, with, against athletes who had been training. And when I was a hockey player, I was I was a very good hockey player. And um, I played provincial, sort of provincial level hockey and also never really trained, just kind of like I remember doing fitness tests where I'd like beat everyone and fall over and almost die. But that competitive spirit was so fierce in me and I refused to ever get to stopped halfway. Like every teammate always like kind of got stopped halfway in the game and I would play until I saw stars. And, <laughs> you know, so I have that natural um, athletic kind of, yeah, um, tendencies. And it was always kind of my thing. It was always something I was good at. And then I decided, then I just became a complete rebel in school. I didn't fit into the whole school kind of box. So yeah. If we, were allow, if we weren't allowed earrings, I'd have wear one earring in each year. And if when they allowed us to wear one earring, I've got a second piercing kind of thing. If we weren't allowed to wear a belt, I would wear my belt as soon as they, you know, that kind of thing. It was just like a complete nightmare for my parents and my teachers. Um, but that actually, you know, that like fed me well in my cycling career, that strong wilderness and that, you know, Competitiveness, yeah. Competitiveness, yeah. And then being a natural athlete as well, obviously, came into hand. <laughs> well, the competitive, competitiveness obviously came out very early because when your mother challenged, challenged you and you did uh, eight kilometers one day and a, six weeks later you did 94.7, that's certainly a, a streak of uh, I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah, listen, that streak, um, <laughs> that streak came out at about birth. So... <laughs> <laughs> Parents, you <laughs> very actually very grateful for my um, for the cycling, which really gave me a positive outlet and channel for that energy. And uh, as mentioned earlier, you you did uh, 2009 94.7. By 2010, you'd already won the South African single speed championships. I mean, that's yeah. that's unreal. So that From was a girl who was riding eight kilometers and crying to a girl who was winning the South African titles. Yeah, so I did, you know, I'm very all or nothing. So I got on a bike and decided that SA Champs was actually in 2011. Um, in 2010, I was still riding my Skadonk bike and um, like riding against the best girls, but being getting dropped in the neutral zone and ending about an hour behind them. So, but even then, like, I just knew, I was like, I looked at my dad and I looked at the podium and I said, one day I'm going to beat those goals. But I didn't, I mean, I'd barely even gone, you know, like, I didn't even have a proper bike. Um, and in 2011, I quit my hairdressing job. So I was a hairdresser before then. And I quit that job to ride full time. And that's when, that next day I won the SA Champs. But I mean, to be fair, it, like, single speeding is like really fun rider kind of <laughs> it's not exactly like a professional sport it's more fun well you say it's fun and yet you uh won the single speed world champs in 2012 uh yeah. and 2015 came second in 2013 so it can't be too much fun there must be some element of uh challenge to it yeah look riding with no gears and no suspension is a huge challenge which I absolutely loved and the sort of transition from being a party animal into being an athlete kind of that's where the the lines blur in single speeding so you're drinking during the ride and after the ride and and that but I mean it's still really hard racing and doing these courses with one gear and like I said no suspension is <laughs> a proper yeah. challenge and tell us about the special prize that uh, the the winner of the the world champs gets yeah, so there's one rule in single speeding. If you don't want a tattoo, don't win. <laughs> so they literally take you off the finish line. You get tattooed for life right there after, you know, after you've won the race. Um, it's definitely, those races, I mean, were definitely some highlights of my career. They were, it's such a fun, it's such a fun vibe. And, you know, it's not like marathon world champ. Or it's, it's very much like more of a fun thing, but it's, this is still flipping hard racing and the memories and the the vibe and getting that tattoo was the most amazing feeling at the time. <laughs> yeah. Mm 
Hello. Okay, cool. Hello. Yeah, yeah, st I'm st still here with you. Um, what made you then move on to um, cross country and, and marathons and that sort of thing? I was doing cross country kind of from the beginning, which is where I gained a lot of my skill. So that was also really jumping in the deep end because I went from having basically no idea, no fear, no no skill, which is probably the most dangerous combination you can have. Um, I just I went like straight into cross country, so um, watched as much as I could, listened, got the you know just like followed as many riders as I could around to to improve my skills and so that's how I improved my skills really quickly. Um, and I was actually I did the I was in the team for the World Champs by 2013 as well. So yeah, I did ramp up really quickly. I did get my um, just through a whole lot of hard work. I literally went absolutely flat out into improving my skills, winning races, doing as much as I as much as I could because I also had no had no kind of financial support or anything. Um, like my parents couldn't support me in that way so i needed to do, just race as much as i could and get my name out there in order to kind of launch my own career which you've certainly done and and you've done well um the manga in 2015 you won that that's a that's quite a, a feat because that's not a short race no no not short um yeah 2015 2016 were the most character building years of my career I kind of went through a phase where I thought let me do the absolute hardest things possible <laughs> so I can see that I could do it and then once I knew that I could I'd, I'd gone so hard I think I, <laughs> I'll never ever do that again um, but it's definitely I mean the manga is a thousand k's in the desert 45 degrees from Bloemfontein to Wellington um, with a flat out headwind for three and a half days like that's how long it took and it was yeah, one of the hardest, most character building experiences I've ever had. Um, I was 26. I was racing against people who had all this experience with, um, like adventure racing, and mm. you know, a lot older. So I just kind of pitched with my camelback, and I left my whole saddlebag <laughs> behind, which usually would be big enough to carry extra kits and everything. So I took one extra kit. I didn't have like most of the stuff I needed. I just sort of did it and through pure um stubbornness and yeah. mental kind of strength I guess I made it through and I ended up winning it somehow I actually I don't even know I had moments where I broke down and just cried and I was so dehydrated my tongue was swollen in my mouth and I had tendonitis in my knees my Achilles um absolutely just riddled in um, saddle sores and and tendonitis so but I just had to keep on going like it wasn't an option and uh yeah like the magical moments I mean I was in Sutherland at midnight and I just looked I lay down on the ground at midnight and looked at the stars and it was just there was almost more stars than black sky and like moments like that which just it gives me goosebumps even thinking about it and mm -hmm. And knowing the pain that you can push through, and I'm, you know, you can't do that as a pro because it stuffs you up for months afterwards. Mm. It's just, it's not possible. But I'm really glad that I had those probably two years of doing these crazy things. Um, I won a 24-hour race once against Alex Harris, who's probably one of our best um, endurance racers in the country, if not like one of the best in the world. And mm. I ended up beating him. I did this like 417 k's of 7k laps um, yeah and also completely broken after that traumatized for life but <laughs> I ended up winning and the prize money was half for the woman so they had to, the organizer was like what does he do he needs to double my prize money because now I've beaten all the men so that was we'll another give you both. sorry we'll give you both yeah <laughs> yeah so they doubled my prize money yeah, so those years, I must say, I had uh, I did the hardest stage race in the world in Italy, the Iron Bike Italy, where you sometimes walk with your bike for three hours up Alps to over 3,000 meters of altitude. The one day took me 10 hours. Like, I did these crazy things, which, like like I say, I'll probably never do again. Um, <laughs> but really, some of the best memories and the, the best kind of lessons I've learned about myself that I've brought forward in my in my professional career now. 
And what made you then change on to the more um, sort of well-known races, the more, not easier races, but the settle down into the more professional career per se? Um, I always wanted to compete and be one of the best. Like from the beginning, that was sort of my goal when I looked at that podium and I said, hey, dad, I'm going to be up there one day. Um, so that was more, I think I digressed a little bit and then I came back to what I wanted to do. I wanted to be there with the top goals. I wanted to be able to race there because that is, at the end of the day, you can do the manga when you're 40, 50, but you can't, mm. your professional career and where you can be at an elite level is a lot shorter and it ends when you're a lot younger. Um, so I really mm. wanted to give that my best shot and, and try and do world champs and, and be the best that I could be amongst, amongst the best. And also, I love riding my bike. Like, I love the technical stuff and the downhill riding. That's what really feeds my soul. And doing the manga and those crazy things, it's just like, that was just to just to show myself that I could do it, basically. Yeah. But it's not fun. <laughs> well, uh, Amy, you certainly hit the, the scene very quickly. Um, you were second in the Marathon Champs in 2017. Uh, you came uh, second in a mixed team at the the Epic in, again in 2017. Yeah. For or going from those extreme races to the more traditional races, you you settled very quickly into into um, into that group. Yeah, the 2017 was definitely kind of a breakthrough year for me. Um, I came 15th at World Champs as well. I think what I did is I just when I do something I go full out into it. So when I went full into doing the crazy things, I then completely shifted that energy into into doing the best that I could in in the elite scene. And yeah, I guess I am I'm lucky that I I did I sort of called myself a jack of all trades for a while because I did some cross country, some I just love everything and I ended up being relatively good at everything. But you know, like they say, Jack of all trades or master of none. Um when I put that energy into being more of a master, I definitely improved quite a lot. Well, and that just showed in your results. Uh, 2018, 2019, uh, you won the Wine to Wales, you won Bergen Bush twice, uh, you won the uh, African uh, women's jersey at the Epic, uh, and that's just to name a few. Um, you've had a, a very su successful career in, in a very short span. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it. Like it's it's funny hearing that because it, it feels like it all happened over a very long period of time, and there were far more failures in between all those successes. So when you just like count the successes, and it does seem like it, but it was it's yeah, there were a lot more failures. I promise. <laughs> uh, and we'll, we'll get to that because I'd like to hear about some of those. But um, 2020, you were supposed to ride the Epic with Sabine uh, Schmitz or Spitz from Germany. That must have been a bit of a disappointment when it was cancelled on the Friday, uh, two days before the start. Yeah, it was quite a shock, I must say. Um, yeah, just like that, the COVID thing, just every single day got more and more sort of, at first we thought, oh, it's just a little flu. And then I remember, I think it was a week before, we were saying, oh, this virus is like so overrated and everything and then within like the next few days it just escalated so much mm. and then all of a sudden the epic was cancelled and it was this massive shock because we had spent basically since December training for it and we had two really really strong teams and really high hopes for the epic so yeah it was definitely a disappointment. And are you pushing those plans forward to 2021? Yeah definitely yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, many, you know, it happens. It is what it yeah. is. So. Yeah, yeah, I know for sure. Uh, Amy, career high? Career Any high. Specific moment? Yeah, that stands out. Gosh, the 94.7 in 2008. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, yeah, it's really, it's hard to, to pick one. It's like, there's just been so many, um, for so many different reasons. I think, you know, the manga obviously was just mad and Iron Bike in Italy and then the single speed world champs were really cool. Um, and 
coming 15th at World Champs was definitely a high. I went, I had the wrong bike. I was the first one to cross the line on a dual SAS bike and I just, I didn't have support and all of that. Um, so that was really, that was a really cool moment to, to be right up there with the best in the world. And, you know, mm. very, very motivating for the rest of my career. So that was definitely a high. Um, and then winning wines to Wales was great because I'd had a really bad year last year, actually. It wasn't many successes last year at all. Um, I had an operation. So first, I just struggled with my form. I was just nowhere. No matter what I did, I just, it just happens. As an athlete, sometimes it happens. And I started getting really despondent. I actually wanted to just quit riding at a point um, in about April last year. And I realized I had a, a breathing issue that I've had my whole life that was misdiagnosed as asthma, um, called ILO, which I needed to have an operation in London for, which um, set me back even more. But then, and we didn't even know if the operation would really work, but it did eventually. So it took about three, four months for the operation to actually like really have shown good results. And coming back to win wines to Wales for me was super, probably my career high, I'd probably say, because you know, going through that and then and then um, just I lost faith completely in myself and then to, to win against the best in the world in Wines to Wales was just, yeah. yeah, the best feeling ever. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, and you mentioned earlier a, a few failures, career low? Probably epic last year. Um, we... I was supposed to ride with Sam Sanders, my partner, and she was just flying. She was so strong, and I just could not get that strong. Like I said, I just struggled with my form. I just, you know, and the closer the epic got, the more I just realized I'm not going to be strong enough for her. And then um, at the race, I ended up getting sick, and we had to pull out after, like, the third day. So that was really... I think I'm, I'm like, I knew I let her down and I let my team down and, and all of that. So that was probably like a real low for me. And after that, I also just thought, let me, I actually just want to throw the towel in. But my psychologist, my sports psychologist said, just, you know, see the rest of the year through, you know, make any decisions now. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was, yeah, pretty bad. And I'm sure you're glad that you, you didn't throw in that towel. Yeah. Um, Amy, the dynamics of stage racing, obviously the majority of them are, are teams of two. Chat to us a little bit about the dynamics because riding a race like the Epic can become tricky on your own. Well, I mean, you know, in your own space. Now you're having to put up, put up with someone else's drama. Chat to us a little bit about having to manage team dynamics for a, a race as difficult as the Epic. Yeah, I think having a team makes it really interesting because you both have your strengths and weaknesses and it's all about, you know, how do you make the most out of your partner? Um, what most people do, and I see it every single year, these, uh, especially these guys, they, they'll they race their partner. So <laughs> they see a team race as an opportunity to kind of show off to their teammate how strong they are or how to break their teammate, which is really probably the worst thing you can do. So, um but as you know, with us girls and as professionals, we we know how to kind of make like you know use our strengths and weaknesses um, in a you know in a way to get us over the line the quickest. So, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm just trying to get my um, yeah. You've got to, I think. The, the point is not to have drama. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> like, if you have a problem, you if you have a like a puncture, you stay calm, you fix it as fast as possible, you carry on going. Like, you don't get upset and flustered. And if your partner's weak, you help your partner. If you're weaker, you let your partner help you and you communicate really well. Um, you know, if you're struggling, you just say so. Somebody's always going to be the weaker partner. You're both going to have your dips in energy. Um, so you just help each other out and, and keep calm, not, not let your egos get in the way, I think is the, the main trick. Okay. And, uh, Amy, do you have any superstitions before you get on the bike, when you're on the bike, after you off the bike, anything that you do 
they're a strange trait that no one else specifically does? Um, I'm really not a superstitious person. So I kind of, I really, I love listening to my music. So that's really important to me to have, to have good music before my race and um, to really just get into the zone like that. But um, mm. no, probably no, <laughs> not really. Okay. And Amy, just in closing, um, if you had to give advice to a girl that was in a similar position to where you were at school, um, was rebelling against parents, rebelling against school, you know, wanted to be the, the prove themselves, but yet get to where you've got to in your career, what, what advice would you give to them? Probably to find probably, you know, to be true to yourself and to really um, look at what makes you happy and not what other people think you should be doing. So, and just give it your all and don't worry about what other people think and what other people are saying. Do your absolute best and there's going to be a lot of failures in the way, but, you know, just carry on pushing through and keep persevering. Excellent. Thanks, Amy. It's been great chatting to you today on, on Sport SA Daily Diary. Thank you for your time. Uh, thanks, thanks for your patience with all the technical issues. Um, and yeah, good luck with the lockdown. Yeah, glad I know now how to work Skype. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Cheers. Watch us again tomorrow on Sport SA Daily Diary, where we'll be chatting to South African ultra-distance athlete Grant Lottering.